Hi guys, it is Dom here from where I've just had the wonderful opportunity to chat to Tom Horrigan, a well-known newsreader in the UK, uh, worked for the BBC, worked for Sky News, and he has set up a mental health awareness platform called Newsbreak, Take a Newsbreak, uh, and you guys should really check it out. It is wonderful, there's supportive resources there, there's articles from journalists talking openly about their mental health, and uh, it was a pleasure to shine the spotlight on uh, Tom's work, and, uh, and Newsbreak itself, it's a fantastic platform and hopefully you'll find out more information through this and hopefully you'll enjoy it thank you so much for checking this out and please go and support tom and uh, Newsbreak with their work okay take care thank you bye it's a pleasure to sit with you today i discovered Newsbreak uh at uclan at sea jam when i was uh when i was over there and, and i think what Newsbreak is doing is fantastic um but it started because you have or you had health anxiety and you were kind of opening up about that. You opened up about that and then people started talking to you. How was that opening up publicly um, in the in the middle of a pandemic? Because it was in the pandemic, wasn't it? And all that sort of anxiety around that. How was that opening up yourself to the world and your anxieties, you know, for, 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 for a lot of people to see? Well, it really is good to talk to you as well, Don. Um, it's pretty bad, actually. Um, <laughs> the first time that I suggested opening up about my mental health issues, it was to my therapist. And he said to me, is that something you're sure you want to do? And I said, and I sort of sat there and thought about it for a minute in silence. And then I thought, well, why not me? Why not speak about the issue I faced? Um... Doing what I do and working for the BBC, I have a little bit of a platform. I've got a little bit of a platform on social media with, you know, a reasonable number of followers who are actually going to see any story that I have to tell about myself or any message that I want to give to people, be that to reassure them or to inform them or whatever it might be. And so I thought, well, why shouldn't it be me? Mm. So I decided before I set up Newsbreak, um, I thought that I would talk a little bit about health anxiety, what it was. I think for a very long time, people had kind of chalked it up as hypochondria, where you're seen to be worrying about nothing really, um, and people don't understand that it is a real condition, and that you end up having physical symptoms manifesting as a result of your anxiety, uh, rather than it just being all in the mind, as I think it would have been described in the past. So I wanted to let people know that this was a thing and it was something that I was going through. And I didn't really want to be silent anymore about it because it actually, for me, helped me to talk about it and be that because it was cathartic or it just helped me to get it off my chest. I kind of felt a bit of a burden was taken off my shoulders when I did that. And I think partly it was because I'd kind of been pushed from pillar post in the health system when I was trying to have this rest. Um, and I went through multiple rounds of therapy with different people. Initially, we really didn't get to the bottom of it at all. It ended up being quite a struggle. My health anxiety got very bad at one point. Uh, to the point where I was on the floor of a hospital being sick, waiting for the results of some tests for an illness that I didn't have. And it can consume your life. And I don't think that people necessarily, if they don't know anyone who doesn't have health anxiety, realises that. And I didn't really sort of have a goal when I decided to go public. But I'm so glad I did, because... After I did that, again, this is before Newsbreak came into being, I had people who I knew reasonably well coming to me and saying, oh my God, I have health anxiety too. I go through the same things that you do every single day and I've never really told anyone except my partner or my mum or my dad about it. And it is so reassuring to me to know that there is someone else out there who is going through the same thing. And it's like anything in life, sharing your experiences, sharing any struggles that you might have, the good times and the bad, can be 
an amazingly empowering experience to remove the isolation that you might feel. And so I was really glad to do it. And like I say, a news break kind of spiraled after that. Mm. Yeah, it's incredible that the journey that it's that it's gone through. Do you feel comfortable? Because obviously, again, you are uh, in the public eye. You talk, you know, for a living, and, and you are you are working in the news all the time. How how is it being a spokesperson for mental health in journalism? You've been picked up by journalism.co.uk a number of times. You've been interviewed before uh, around this sort of this project that you have. Are you comfortable in that role as a spokesperson? And and I guess, you know, are there any transitional skills that you've taken from your work uh, into that role? Uh, wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it helps that because I am a communicator by trade, it's what I do. I'm an express broadcaster. I'm comfortable talking to very large audiences, although it's slightly weird in radio when, you know, I'm reading the news on radio too, to millions of people, literally millions, and you don't see a single one of them. You're sat in a room on your own with a microphone in front of you and just imagining the people that you're actually um, having this uh, conversation with. But it certainly helps. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this long enough now. You know, I've been working in journalism for the best part of 15 years. So, I'm quite confident speaking in front of a crowd. Obviously, it takes on an entirely different meaning when you're speaking about yourself. If I'm delivering the news, the news stories aren't about me. They're about other people. And, you know, sometimes we're talking about people's horrendous experiences, but you are one step removed from that. Mm. You are there to deliver the news impartially and fairly and uh, professionally, uh, most importantly. And so when you're suddenly opening up about a struggle that you have had yourself uh does feel a little bit weird, or it certainly did to begin with. I remember when I first tweeted about my health anxiety, I had my finger sort of hovering over the tweet button. I thought I could easily just save this in drafts or think about this. Do I want to share it? The sort of words of my therapist ringing in my ears, is this something you really want to say? But I hit send. The response was amazing. Very, very positive. A little bit later, um, I decided to share that I took medication. It was kind of a time when people were uh, doing the whole hashtag post your pill thing. And uh, I wanted to show that, you know, there is no shame. There is still a massive stigma attached to taking medication for for mental health conditions in particular. Um, and there doesn't need to be. Um, and I wanted to show that you know, there is absolutely no shame whatsoever in having medicinal help in uh, helping you manage a condition. And so there was an amazingly uh, positive response to that as well. And uh, I don't see myself as a spokesperson for mental health, per se, because I can only speak from my own experience. The thing about doing news break is that the whole variety of stories that we've had from journalists who've come forward to share with me on a, you know, in the first point, you know, trusting me enough to be able to share their stories and giving them a platform that they feel confident that we will do those stories justice mm. means a huge amount to me, but I would never dream of claiming that I represent a, uh, journalists mental health in the rounds that's not what i'm there to do i'm there the whole reason that newsbreak was set up was to create a platform to get the conversation going and to let journalists tell their own stories in their own words i shared my story to begin with because it was a legitimate starting point it helped explain how the site had come into being why i was doing what i decided to do and the response was absolutely phenomenal. I had no idea whether anybody would be willing to kind of put their head above the parapet initially, because it's a big thing. Mm. It's an absolutely massive thing, Don, to go ahead and say, actually, I've decided I'm going to speak about the depression that I've had, uh, the effect of family bereavement has had on me, the mental health trauma of abuse that I've received online. Um, it's a massive thing to be brave enough to share that public and you do have to have a little bit of bravery about you to do it it's not an easy thing to do but unanimously everyone who has done it 
um, has since told me that, you know, they're really glad they did because, again, they felt they were helping people. They had people they knew who had never opened up to them about mental health or issues like this mm. uh, and then telling them, yeah, similar experiences have happened to me. And it's like I say about getting that conversation going, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about this as well, but at the time that Newsbreak was set up, these conversations were not happening. And it was completely under the radar that it became very clear during the pandemic that that had to change. Mm, mm. Yeah. And and you've done incredible work on the site, you know, in terms of, you know, building those conversations, some incredible articles. I do want to ask you about the work life balance that you have sort of found, you know, because I think I obviously heard your voice reading the news many a time. But the first time I saw you, uh, you know, uh, in that kitchen, you just come off a night shift. I think you were doing I think you'd done a full night. And and that was why you were you were uh, you were sort of recovering and resting from that. And I wonder the responsibility of Newsbreak and balancing that with your uh, with you, your your very intense other work, how how have you found that? And are you still finding ways to to to? Are you practicing what you preach effectively? You know the self care and things like that because you have a lot of responsibility. And now, of course, Newsbreak is its own responsibility as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The work life balance is a difficult thing, mm. and it's particularly difficult for a role like mine where I work shifts. Mm -hmm. So we work a three days on, three days off pattern. And the three days on will be in a kind of similar time frame. So you will do, uh, for example, the three days that I've just done, I was starting at 7.30 each morning. But then the day in the middle of that, I was starting at 6 o'clock because I was on the radio a couple of days ago. And then you'll have your three days off and then you'll go on to late and you'll start at 11 a.m. and you'll be working to 11 p.m. And then you'll go on to night shifts. Night shifts are the hardest for me personally. It's very much... Uh, personal preference some people find them easier than others I've kind of worked funny hours all my life but this has been the first job really where I've been rotating through hours on such a regular basis when I used to um, read the breakfast news on magic radio I was getting up at 4 a.m every morning but at least it was a routine you're doing the same every day it might be a crazy routine but it is at least the same and you have a bit of regularity to your sleep etc now I don't really have that. And I've been doing this job with this rotor pattern in varying forms for just over five years now. It is tough. And so I have to make sure that I'm getting enough rest. I'm getting enough sleep. Certainly since news breaks created and I've, you know, had the pleasure of working with and um, collaborating with fantastic mental health professionals like Dr. Radha Modgill, who is one of the UK's best experts on self-care and looking after yourself. I've taken a lot from the conversations that I've had with her, namely that I try to look at the news less when I'm not at work. It can be very, very difficult. It was particularly difficult during the pandemic because of the rate of change of news. So if I'd come off a night shift and I was home at 9am, say, and I would get up again at 8pm, the agenda could have completely changed. The government could have changed all the COVID restrictions again. And so I would have so much information to process in my own mind before going back to work and giving that information to the public. And it's a responsibility I take incredibly seriously because, you know, particularly during COVID, people were relying on the stuff we were telling them to live, to live their lives, to work out whether they were going to be able to go out the front door or go to the shop or or meet with more than four people. And so, so there was a huge pressure on my shoulders in that point. I felt I had to keep up to date. But, you know, we found a news break in the start of 2021. And through 2020, I did not do anything other than work, stay at home, and doom scroll. That's all I did. And I felt that it was really important for me to keep up to date with the news as much as I possibly could. So on days off, I would be constantly on Twitter, news websites. I'd have news TV on. I would be totally immersed in it. Mm. And that's probably why it became overwhelming, not just for me, but for so many other people. And I started to notice that in colleagues who I hadn't really noticed mental health issues in before. 
And that was the point I thought, actually, we've got to start talking about this. We can't just let this go unspoken in newsrooms. We need to actually have a proper conversation. So we can be very difficult. But absolutely, I, I take very seriously the self-care now. Um, the last year, I, I have been exercising far more than I ever did. I've kind of had a bit of a love hate exercise with uh, a relationship with exercise in the past where I've gone through phases of, yeah, let's go running, let's do 5Ks every couple of days and whatever, and then I get bored and then I'd stop. So what I did, um, and I'm, you know, in, in a fortunate enough position to be able to do this, I got myself a personal trainer and it completely transformed my view of exercise going to the gym. I was really kind of um, clueless about, doing weights or operating any equipment in a gym and it completely transformed me i've been to the gym this morning don before we uh came on on this call and i sort of woke up feeling quite tired i just come off three days and sort of you know um thinking we've got quite a long day ahead got quite a lot going on and so i go and spend an hour doing weights and my mood completely changes i've got energy for the rest of the day i feel rejuvenated it's something so important and it's about doing things that actually give you energy, make you happy. And it's also about uh, doing things that are so far removed from the news that you can enjoy uh, some time, a couple of hours, just doing what you enjoy, be that playing on Xbox or reading a book or going for a walk or doing whatever it is you enjoy doing. And it's really important to do that and just put your phone to one side for a couple of hours and don't let what's going on in the outside world actually affect you and your mindset. And mindfulness can be such a, a, a really positive, empowering thing. Mm. I think it's really important that I practice what I preach because it's certainly making me a happier person, that's for sure. Oh, that, that's uh, so wonderful to hear, Tom. I'm really, honestly, so excited for the future of news break. And I do wonder, you strike me as a very passionate you know, person. You obviously love journalism. You love the job you do, which is fantastic. How has it been creating content uh, for news break? You mentioned doom, you know, you mentioned doom scrolling in, in the first video I saw you and you talked about it there, putting your phone down. When you're, when you're creating an article like the switch off struggle, how are you enjoying that process? Because I guess this is your your editorial vision, your creative process, you're building a team of people and creating this content. How is that, you know, again, having this uh, vision of yours come to life and, and creating content like that? How do you enjoy that process? It's absolutely fantastic. And it's, I, I, I mean, some of this content really speaks to me. And so some of it is based purely out of personal experience. And I think, well, actually, I'd like some answers on some of this stuff. So let's get them. We did um, a survey last year where we spoke to journalists across newsrooms, and that was something that I was really keen to do. You know, it was a fairly long and detailed survey, but people were sufficiently interested in the platform to take part in it and speak very honestly and candidly about their own experiences. And that led us to finding some really interesting things about the way that mental health was managed in newsrooms and the way that people felt it could be improved be that through better access to support or more leniency from managers when staff need time off at short notice because they're unable to cope with the, the mental load that they're facing initially when we were going through um individual stories i was really keen to make sure that we had a variety of different experiences on there and the number of people who came forward with a whole variety of different stories to tell was absolutely fascinating. It was fantastic to work with them to once I'd actually, you know, gone through the process of making Newsbreaker a platform that covers mental health across the spectrum, having people telling me about their struggles with depression or bereavement or other issues and opening my eyes up to so many different aspects of mental health and making me fully appreciate in a way that I hadn't fully done so before that everyone has different stories to tell. There is so much scope to 
broaden this out into a huge movement of people who feel that they can speak honestly and candidly about mental health and inspiring people looking at that content. And here's the, you know, the main reason that I'm still pushing the platform forward and doing everything that I'm doing with it. I want people to be able to go to that website, look at that content and feel that they, if they are suffering or if they have issues that they hadn't perhaps felt confident raising with a manager or people close to them, that they can do that and they will have their voice heard. That voice will be respected and that voice will be acted on and things will change for the better as a result of those conversations. And it's something so important. And I am always amazed at the people who get in touch with me and say, thank you. And I didn't do this for praise. No, I did this because I genuinely felt the conversation needed to be had because I saw friends, good friends in some cases, who were getting really depressed. And it was that time where we were just coming out of the Christmas lockdown in 2020. And I think psychologically, people thought that as we were going into a new, new year, maybe things would change, coronavirus would hopefully just disappear as the weather got warmer again. It didn't. We went back into another lockdown in early 2021. And it was almost as if we had this kind of communal dropping of faces. People thought, oh my God, we're going to have to live with this again for goodness knows how many more months. How are we going to get through this? You had the huge pressure on people who were dealing with lower workloads because they'd been furloughed, so they had financial pressures added to everything else that they'd gone through. You had people who were working remotely, who had never worked remotely before and were facing a whole different set of challenges, being very isolated in jobs where they were usually surrounded by people. We had reporters coming to us who spent their whole day going out and about with a notepad or a microphone right up in front of people's faces. Mm -hmm. And that suddenly was all removed. Everything they knew in their professional life was dismantled in an instant. And we weren't talking about it. People just kind of felt they had to get on with it. Mm -hmm. And it was such a seismic change that it was no surprise, really, that people felt this to be a huge psyche shift. And, you know, we've got a couple of blogs on the website from people who talked about this and the challenges that they faced as a result of this. Mm. Um, and I like shining a light on these stories. And it's, you know, you know, it's similar to my job in a way in that I I'm very fortunate to be in a position where I get to shine a light on stories. And I am incredibly passionate because of the work that I've done in local media in the past before I started working for uh, the BBC nationally and, you know, Sky News and other people. Um, about making sure that we hear the most diverse range of voices possible mm. um, because it's really, really important. And it's the same with Newsbreak. I want to make sure that we are properly reflecting as many experiences that we can from people from a whole range of backgrounds. And I was very, very keen that it didn't just end up being a platform where we would have straight, white, able-bodied men talking about their mental health experiences. It had to be for everyone. Mm. And... Um, that is a continuing process and I want to shine a light on those processes and the, those great stories because it's vital that particularly people who feel that it is more difficult for them to share their story, be that because they are a person of colour or they are um, uh, struggling with something very serious in their life or they have a disability their stories are as valid as anybody else's. And I want to make sure that we're showcasing them to the same audience and getting a spotlight equally on those. Yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic opportunity. And I do think, you know, uh, four or five more questions now, Tom, before we finish up. I think, you know, looking at some of those articles, as, you know, uh, James Waterhouse has contributed a very honest uh you know, article on there. Other journalists have contributed, you know, with great honesty, like you mentioned. You discussed the the you know, having those conversations and the difficulty that some people have talking about mental health. 
has it been a challenge getting people to open up to that level where there's such honesty? You almost feels like you're talking to some. Well, it feels like those, you know, the words are jumping off the page. These people are talking directly to me as a reader. And, and it, you know, has it been difficult to get that honesty, to get that raw openness uh, from people uh, in terms of the realities of pulling a, a, an outlet like this together and getting such such openness? It's another good question, Dom, and it completely depends on the person. We, I've approached people whose stories I would really like to share, mm -hmm. and I always approach them with, you know, the idea that it has to be from them and they are in control. They have complete power over the stories that we're telling, and if they don't want to open up, I'm certainly not going to force them. And, you know, we've hopefully moved on enough in journalism and journalism practices to not force people to say something that they don't want to say. Every article that we publish has been with the full consent of people. It does snowball in a way, because if you see other people sharing your, their experiences, I think you're more inclined to share your own because you see a whole range of voices who are prepared to open up and you think, well, it was okay for them. They didn't suffer any negative consequences from doing it. So maybe I should as well. But I've approached some very well-known figures who didn't feel that they were comfortable doing so. And that's fine. Not everyone wants to talk about it. And that is as valid as someone who wants to shout about it from the rooftops. Mm. Mental health is something so incredibly personal. Yeah. And you have to manage it in your own way. And the very last thing that I would want to do is for someone to think, oh, well, other people are sharing their stories, so I feel like, like I have to. Mm. And they end up pressuring themselves to do it. They don't end up being comfortable with it. And it ends up making their own situation worse. Their mental health problems become worse as a result. That's not helping anyone. And that's mm. not what we want to do. Mm. You know, it's so important that, you know, uh, we have that consent embedded in everything that we do. And again, this speaks to wider journalism um, because people need to be the authors of their own lives. And if that doesn't include a public declaration on mental health, then so be it. So we have had some difficulties in getting people to come forward. But, in you know, by contrast, some people have literally bombarded my inbox and say here's my blog <laughs> and just like please publish it um and that's fantastic and you know i do very very little editing to those blogs that appear on the website they are almost entirely the original work of those people because i want them to describe their experience in their own words and like i say when you see other people doing that um people do feel more confident about coming forward themselves. We did something quite interesting um, last year. We organized a couple of safe space sessions. So we invited people on our Twitter platform to sign up if they wanted to come to a Zoom group that we ran on a weekday evening where people would just come and talk about the stuff that was going on in their lives and difficulties they were having in newsrooms or mental health problems in their personal lives and whatever. And the whole idea was to have a kind of Chatham House rule set up about that. So none of that conversation went anywhere. We didn't publish the list publicly of who came along. People didn't have to contribute if they didn't want to. They could come under a false name. They didn't have to turn their camera on. They didn't have to turn their mic on. They could just sit and listen. And some people did because it just reassured them, again, to know that there were other people who were going through some of those similar situations. Mm. The people who decided that they did want to talk and turn their camera on and turn uh, their microphone on, came up with some really profound and personal experiences. And I think everybody was really moved to hear them. And then some people, after those sessions, decided to talk about them publicly and tweeted, I've just taken part in this. This has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. And again, it's that opportunity to open up that I think a lot of these journalists, particularly ones who've been working remotely, didn't feel that they necessarily had in their newsrooms. Yes. And I know, you know, without naming names of organisations, it is still taboo in some companies to say, actually, I have a mental health problem and I really need some support with this and some flexibility in terms of having a difficulty on a certain day and perhaps not being able to come in to do my shift 
I need you to be able to understand that and to be able to give me the time off. Mm. And some organizations are much better at facilitating that than others. Mm. That's still a work in progress. I've been doing work within the BBC as part of a, a bigger group that I don't lead, but I'm a part of. Um, working on helping refine mental health practices and the way that we deal with mental health uh, within the corporation. But it is about having that chat in the first place. And some of the people coming forward to us had never even considered something like therapy or even going to their GP to talk about it. Mm. That's fine too. It doesn't matter. Mm. Um, and I think people put pressure on themselves to... Mm maybe suffer in silence they feel maybe it's more dignified or they don't want to make themselves more vulnerable you know the one thing i would say above any other is please don't please don't suffer in silence people want to help you the people around you want to help you the nhs wants to help you mm. um and there is so much support out there and if newsbreak makes it easier for journalists to think well actually I can now go to my GP. I've been inspired by something I've seen. Something really chimes with me. And maybe I've got an idea of what the thing I'm feeling might be called or whatever. And I can go and explain this to my doctor. Mm. Then great. Um, we've done our job. And that for me has been, I think, the most rewarding thing. But just having the option, like I say, I've said it several times in this conversation, but I'll say it again. The opportunity to talk yeah, and to be honest and to open up about something that was closed for a very long time is yeah. very, very important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think there's a, a wider conversation to be had around, uh, particularly with, with young people, with students. Now, without again, without naming any names, I think there are, you know, uh, certainly when I was doing my internships in London, I did my MA in magazine journalism. So I did, did all the magazine internships and I was uh, wobbling around, uh, running around, you know, like a blue ass fly trying to get jobs done and making teas and doing all that stuff. And then there were certain, you know, um, universities and they do this sort of speed, speed networking thing, you know, where they have to pitch and stuff like that. And, and that's fine. But, but I think there's a lot of pressure on young people with these careers, these glamorous, you touched on it a little bit in your video, uh, you know, these sort of glamorous, cool careers that, that you know, uh, you know, you're on television, you know, you, you're, you're reading, you've been on TV, you've done all kinds of stuff, you know, and people people love that. But in order to get to where you are, you know, there's, there's so much work that goes into it. You've done years and years of work, but there's a pressure. And I think a lot of young people put pressure on themselves to work, you know, 20 hours, I mean, I did, that's, you know, that's how I discovered, you know, my journey towards mental health was I burnt out because I was doing so much work to try and, you know, live up to expectations of, of the industry and, and what was expected. And I wonder, you know, since you started out, how, you know, what have you seen change? Is there anything you'd still, you still think needs to change in terms of, uh, you know, journalism training and the industry for people breaking into the industry in terms of like, again, mental health support and awareness, because, uh, you know, I was always told the best jobs are the hardest. I was always told, you know, sleep when you're dead was, was what I, you know, and these are old school things that I think are dying out now, but I wonder if you had the same experience and, and whether you still see, you mentioned some newsrooms that, you know, still have some of those attitudes. And so I wonder if I could get your thoughts on that and what you would like to see change, uh, particularly for young people getting into journalism. We could talk about this for another hour, but <laughs> yeah. I'll keep it to, a, I'll keep it to a few minutes. Um, you are completely right. Uh, I'm 37 now. So I did my journalism training in 2008. And things have changed a bit since then, in terms of employers being more mindful of things like mental health and employee well being, but there is still so far to go. And I think the difference between uh, then and now is that there is more competition for places. I think there is even more pressure on young people. I think they're, they're exposed to uh, far more content of journalists kind of living the high life and doing all the cool jobs that they think that we do. There's a lot of uncool bits that go with it um, <laughs> that you don't often get to see. 
Um, and that can be really, really tough. I, like you, was working every hour God sent when I started out. You know, while I was at uni doing my undergrad, and I didn't do an undergrad in journalism, uh, my social life badly suffered because every weekend I would drive from Coventry to Kent to present a breakfast show on a radio station at the weekend and then I would drive back up again. So I never saw friends at the weekend, anything like that. When I started at UCLan and began my journalism training, I was freelancing anywhere that would have me, anywhere that would let me be on the radio and read the news, I would go and do it. So I would drive uh, from Preston to Hull and come back in a day, which is ridiculous. And then I would do it again the next day and I'd do it for weeks on end because I was told that that was the way to get on and to make those connections and have my fingers in as many pies as possible. So when I wanted a full-time job after I graduated, there would be lots of options open to me. And I was kind of giving myself the best, uh, the best hand. Um, and it's ridiculous really. And I understand in a, you know, an industry which is so competitive and the, part of the problem that we've got is that since, you know, I graduated, there are far fewer opportunities, particularly in, in radio. Mm. Uh, a lot of newsrooms have closed, emerged because radio stations have consolidated. So we have far fewer opportunities to get on the air now than we did in 2007, 8, 9. Um, I, I sometimes think I don't know what I do now uh, because, you know, working in local radio newsrooms, some of those buildings no longer exist. They've been demolished, which is crazy. And when you have more and more people being accepted onto journalism courses, um, you know, a course that I didn't go on, the, the, the City Journalism course in London, which is kind of seen as one of the best mm -hmm. journalism training courses in Britain, particularly for people who want to go into broadcast. When I was applying, you know, they had a steady stream of applicants. More recently, I've done news days with them. There are dozens of them, dozens and dozens, and that's the people who got accepted. I mean, the overwhelming number of applications that they and Cardiff and Bournemouth and UCLan and other journalisms offering journalism degrees get now is insane because obviously and understandably you've got young people who are consuming what looks to be a very exciting product mostly on social media with fun TikToks from Sky News or, you know, highly curated Instagram posts from the BBC and whatever, and they think, God, yeah, that's what I want to do. And it is an exciting job. And still now, when I tell people who don't know what I do and I explain to them, they go, oh, wow, that's so interesting, whatever. Um, and it is, that, that is why it is so competitive. But being so few opportunities now to get in, the competition is really, really fierce. Mm. And... It's very, very hard for the people who get rejections mm. and who don't have the mental strength to keep going because constant emails telling you, I'm sorry, your application has not been accepted or we can't put you on this mm. placement um, is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how we go about changing that. It's, it's something so difficult and so embedded in the system. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that's really really tricky different newsrooms have gone down different approaches you know the bbc has a kind of formal journalism training scheme where you don't need any kind of university degree and that has helped bring some people from more diverse backgrounds into the newsroom although i will say you know and uh you know even then we're finding that some people ending up on these courses have come from quite prestigious universities etc and, you know, this is across the board where people who are perhaps best set up in life feel willing and more able to push themselves forward. And so we don't necessarily always hear from uh, the voices that we need more of in newsrooms, people from working class backgrounds. I say that as someone who's from a working class background myself. I know, you know, people might not think that the way I speak and everything, but I come from a low income single parent family. Uh, um, and that is something that I have tried to make part of my journalism in that people in similar situations get their voices heard in the output that I prepare. You've got other programmes going on in the industry, you know, Global, the owner of Heart LBC, Classic FM, etc. 
they have their own academy in London where they're bringing people through a whole number of years of kind of broadcast training, which is great. And that's accessible to to a lot more people. And um, Bauer as well, company that I used to work for, has run a journalism training scheme for people who don't have any formal qualifications in this arena beforehand. And they have produced some great reporters and presenters. Um, I could name several off the top of my head. But those schemes are still for the selected few and you have to be very lucky to get on them. And so as an industry, are we doing enough to be mindful of people's experience as they try to get in? I don't know. And I think part of the issue is I think we need to be far more honest about everything that journalism entails Mm. and the rubbish hours and the really hard work and you know, admittedly, in quite a lot of places, particularly in local and regional journalism, terrible pay. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, I think, testament to the allure and the glamour of journalism that despite all that, and people being mindful of that and hearing about it, they still want to do it because they still see it as an exciting career. And it is. I love what I do. Yep. Um, and I am immensely lucky to have had the career that I've had. But what I want to be doing it as a young journalist now, I'm not so sure. It can be very, very difficult. And so we have to support as many young journalists as we can from as wide a variety of backgrounds as we can. And, you know, whether that looks like outreach to places where traditionally we get very few journalists and mm. people who would never really think of it as a possible career path or whatever it might be, something more has got to be done. That's for mm. sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, like I said, before we do the roundup and the plugging bit, uh, where I'm going to ask you to do some plugging for me, I have a question around uh, legacy. Now, I wonder if you think and pay too much attention to your own legacy as a journalist and also the legacy of Newsbreak and what you want to achieve with that. Does your legacy as a journalist and the wider legacy of Newsbreak come into your awareness or is it something that you don't think about very often? I don't really think about it. I mean, uh I, I don't, like I said, I didn't set up Newsbreak thinking, I want to be the face of a mental health platform and it's all about me. It genuinely wasn't. And uh, I had what I thought was enough of a, a public profile and a voice and a, a story to tell that I could sort of hit the ground running. And then I would see where it went from there. I deliberately try to avoid the website uh making reference to me very much there's a little bit if you look at the sort of about page as to how the platform sets up i wrote the first blog because obviously that was uh explaining why the site had come into being in the first place but it really isn't about me and in terms of legacy i mean that's something for other people to decide and i'm a history graduate and as something you know you learn very odd when studying history you are not the master of the story that people will tell about you in the future. Mm -hmm. It will be for other people to judge. And you can try and manipulate that any way you want, but at the end of the day, other people will make their mind up about the work that you do. I still think that people probably think of me first as a BBC broadcaster and then maybe mental health advocate second, if they are aware that that is part of my work. Not everyone is. Um, I don't bring it into every conversation I have in the newsroom. If I'm working, you know, I'm managing a team. I'm not talking about mental health every minute, but uh, it is a very important part of my life because of the experiences that I have had. Health anxiety is still part of my life, although I have it under control now. Um, So that is inherently part of me and If part of my legacy were to be someone who spoke about it honestly and hopefully gave people the opportunity to do the same, then I would be very happy with that. Mm. Um, And combined with the broadcast work that I do, I'm proud of them both. Um, And there is nothing wrong with having pride in what you do. And this is one of the things that I would say to journalists coming up into the industry, along with having lots of good ideas, and having great stories to tell, be they your own or others that you want to share, having pride in what you do and having the confidence to feel proud is something 
that is so important. There is absolutely no shame in thinking, ah, that was actually a really good article or I did a really good job there um, because you will feel better for it. And it's nice to have praise from other people who recognize the work that you do. Everyone feels good when we get praised, even if sometimes we don't believe it. But believing in yourself and actually realizing that if you've got into a place where you have beaten that competition to find yourself in a newsroom, there's a reason that you've been put there. It's because you likely bloody talented. And you should embrace that and take the opportunity and be proud of the work that you do there and use that however you want to in your career, whether you're wanting to move to a different outlet or go national or do whatever. Um, be proud, be confident, be positive. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful advice. Uh, again, to have confidence in yourself. Uh, b- uh, before we finish, then, Tom, to round up, is there anything you feel like I've missed today? Anything you'd like to plug? Obviously, there is, uh, you know, obviously people are going to want to submit articles, hopefully, to you in the future. But is there anything you would like to uh, plug as we finish off? Well, as you say, Dom, anybody who wants to speak publicly about their mental health experience it doesn't have to be something that's happened in a newsroom it can be your own story or things that have gone on in your personal life that you feel that you maybe want to share i will tell your story the way you tell it to me it will be your words you will be the author and i will be delighted to share it on a platform that has had a wonderful response so there's plenty of information at takeanewsbreak.com you can follow us on Twitter, take a news break. Our YouTube channel has the same name. There's a couple of videos on there. That's something that we're hoping to develop. I'm hoping next year that we can get the Safe Space uh, program running up again because that has proved really popular. And so there is already a form on the website where you can go and sign up if you want to take part in the next one. So if you uh, fill in the form, then we'll let you know the date for that one once it's been confirmed. If you want to follow me personally on Twitter, I'm at Tom Harrigan. And yeah, like I say, I am really keen to hear from anyone, even if they just want a chat. They don't have to have it published. I'm more than happy to speak to anyone. And I have done. I've had private conversations with dozens of journalists who have just felt reassured that they're talking to someone who at least gets it, who at least is going to listen to them and might have some advice or be able to point them in the direction of where they might be able to get some support or whatever. And I should say we've got links to support on Newsbreak as well. So do have a look at that. Um, But this isn't all about me um, fishing for content. I want to help other journalists because I know how hard it can be. It's been hard for me. It's been hard for a lot of colleagues, particularly over the last two years. And, I don't want to end the conversation on a on a down note, but with the way the world is right now, um, doing the news and whatever job you might have in journalism is not going to get easier, I don't think, anytime soon. We have a lot of difficult stories to cover. It's an immense privilege, and I mean that genuinely, to be able to give these stories and uh, share them with a, with a very big audience. But in doing that, we have to make sure that the people in these newsrooms are mentally resilient enough to be able to manage that and to be able to take time off that is going to allow them to rest, recuperate, and allow them to do their jobs in the way that they want to do them and to not struggle, and particularly, as I said before, to not suffer in silence. And so if anybody has got any ideas of how they want to you know, move the conversation on in newsrooms, you know, this is by no means a finished project. We're just at the beginning. So get in touch. Take a newsbreak.com. Such an exciting time for you, Tom. And, and thank you so much for your honesty and reflection and your time today. I really, really appreciate it. It'd be great to talk to you, Dom. Thank you.